Welcome, so this is the Religion and Politics uh, session uh, entitled Populism Through the Lens of Religion and Race. Um, so just from the title right off, um, this is something uh, that is right up there, ripped from the headlines kind of session. It's gonna be a fascinating session today. We have four presenters. Um, each will have about 20 minutes. Um, we're gonna take questions at the end. Um, so just kind of hang on to your questions. Uh, we'll kind of make sure we move through. Um, so let me give you an overview of the session and then I'll introduce um, our um, very distinguished presenters as we go. Um, so this session is exploring the impact of religion and race on expressions of American populism. Uh, and we're doing that across the ideological spectrum. Uh, so papers here explore the interplay of religious <clears throat> and secular forces on the Black Lives Matter movement, including a theological exploration of the death of Michael Brown and an examination of how millennial activists are blurring the secular religious boundaries. Uh, it also juxtapose, juxtaposes these topics with examinations of white conservative populist expressions. We have papers exploring the populist elements within the Southern Baptist Convention uh, that laid the foundation for white evangelicals to throw their support behind Donald Trump and among Tea Party women um, whose rhetoric centered around a vision of white Christianity fighting the legality of abortion. So it should be a very, very interesting panel with a lot of breadth and a lot of um, uh, interplay uh, between the topics. Um, so we will uh, start with a presentation by Larisha Hawkins. Um, her uh, paper is entitled, The Reproductive Politics of Evangelical Tea Party Women and the Afterbirth of Trump's America. It, and uh, uh, Larisha is the Abd El Qadr Visiting Faculty Fellow at the Institute for Advanced Studies and Culture. Um, she, her research engages the intersections of race, ethnicity, religion, and politics. She received her undergraduate degree from Rice University and her MA and PhD from the University of Oklahoma. Um, so welcome, Larisha. Good afternoon. We'll have a PowerPoint presentation. And um, as I've taught a course this summer, uh, revolving around these issues this summer, this semester, excuse me, wishful thinking, it's cold outside, um, I have kind of refocused the title um, to Trump, Tea Party Women, and the Rebirth of a White Christian Nation. It engages the same um, questions and topics, uh, but as a political scientist dealing with um, the intersection of these issues and questions, um, the more I studied, the more I realized that this is um, more than um, just a political blip. It um, has consequences for nationness, for statism, and other things. The 2016 elections harken back to the birth of a nation, the film that asserts that for the union to survive, whiteness and nationness must be systematized in the US government. Ironically, it affirms union, um, excuse me, whereas the Trump Tea Party, um, the Trump candidacy and white supremacist movements disaffirm union. They're anti-status, black Americans and others must be put in their proper place. Onward Christian soldiers marching as to race war. White America first, Christian America first. But before we can talk about the rebirth and the afterbirth of Trump's America, we have to talk about the birth of a nation. This film is from 1915 is considered by most accounts among the top 100 of all time. It's a black and white, it's silent, but it's a cinematographic marvel. Um, in 1915, of course, World War I is underway, the war to end all wars, Jim Crowism, racial violence are at their height because, you know, during war, citizenship is always contested. What is intriguing about a film entitled The Birth of a Nation is its peculiar starting point. Free blacks are the anti-citizen. The lines of nation are, and state are contested. The Civil War amendments, reconstruction are unenforced um, and even when enforced, done so with impunity. So the film depicts who is who, and what is what, and what shall be. Who's in, and who's out. The starting point typifies Israel's own amnesia, forgetting God's deliverance and making a king for themselves. The film typifies the collective amnesia of the United States, the rapidity with which whitewashing of history occurs. One of the most interesting elements of the film is the assertion that, the American, that American political development begins 
and ends with the Civil War. While one could call Griffith's choice anachronistic, the film should be read as historical revisionism, a statement about the nascence of the American creed. But why this film? The first third of the film begins with an account of the Civil War from the perspective of two patrician families, one northern and one southern. The northern family, the Stonemans of Massachusetts, um, of good English stock, and the southern family, the Camerons of South Carolina, of Irish descent. Note that resurgence of Irish um, owning, Scotch-Irish, uh, in Hillbilly Elegy and other um, tropes of today. One of the earliest quotes of the film says, the bringing of the African to America planted the first seeds of disunion. This racial triumphalist account, but not merely from the South, um, is of whiteness. It's important to note that claims for state and sectional sovereignty, sovereignty have always been conflated with racial exclusion in the United States, then and now. White union, not a union of whites and blacks, is the political bill sold by the film, and unapologetically so. The film is a peon to kith and kin, read white bloodlines, and emphasizes white solidarity and nationness from the beginning, as contrasted with the farcical war of Northern aggression. Slavery is typified in the film as a coterie of black children in need of salvation from their white masters. House niggers were often mulatto, and very often the children of a master and one of his favorite slaves, read Sally Hemming, and very dark black people cast as uncouth, uncivilized children. Of course, the casting choices made in the film include white actors in blackface, a minstrelizing or making clowns of black folk. Those black-faced whites portray the uppity Negroes with dreams of freedom and ambition. The blacks have one drop of white blood, and they think they're equal, but one drop makes you black, according to hyper descent. Black extras are um, the regular field niggers. They are uncivilized. They play fiddle and clap and shuck and jive. They're depicted as magical Negroes. The house help are portrayed as faithful souls loyal to Massa, who is termed the kindly master and exemplified as St. Francis with a kitten in his lap and puppies at his feet if he treats his pets so well. And they flock to him like birds of St. Francis. Well, slavery must not be so bad after all. And it must befit blacks and not, not only befit blacks, but also benefit them. Um, the Civil War is um, depicted in the film and problematized in the film. Um, but mostly problematized as dissolving um, a faux kind of white togetherness. So the second part of the film highlights the perceived folly of reconstruction via the Freedmen's Bureau. I'm skipping through a lot of things because I don't have a lot of time. Um, and then the KKK is utilized to rouse um, the white masses toward togetherness and also importantly to um, be the salvation of white women. So the cult of si white Southern womanhood is depicted in this film. Okay, Tea Party women. Um, Tea Party Redux, um, taking America back. One of the most important things to note about um, the historical line that I'm drawing between this film, The Birth of a Nation and Tea Party Women, is the extent to which Tea Party women hearken on these tropes of whiteness and togetherness um, and defining citizenship over and against blackness. In fact, defining the first black president as a non-citizen and the rest of black Americans as failed Americans. Um, so Larisha skipping through, skipping through. Um, where you stand concerning this meme depends on where you sit. The left and the right interpret this differently, but the potential subjectivity can mask an objective fact, a legacy of racism and discrimination in this country where blacks donned white face to a leering public. The attribution of white makeup to a self-proclaimed black man who, as we know, is biracial or of mixed heritage should give us pause. The existence of this meme is less problematic than its proliferation by Tea Party patriots. Obama is black, but even in white face, he is socialist and dangerous. Um, this actually, um, this kind of portrayal of Obama, you might note through his presidency, um, leads him to distance himself uh, from anything um, bordering on what we might call a black policy agenda. So the framing of Obama as racist, of 
of like socialist, um, birther, et cetera, has implications. The implicit racial trope in Palin's rhetoric, for example, is that American values are white values and citizenship itself is white. So the Tea Party paints Obama as socialist in chief, engaged in a racialized policy debate in spite of his, the fact that he distances himself from black issues. Um, since the advent of social security, now TANF programs have selectively benefited actually middle-class whites and been framed as, framed as race neutral. Nevertheless, we know that there are racial implications in that framing. There are also apocalyptic implications, but let me just give you a little bit um, of info about what's interesting to me about grassroots Tea Party women, not these women per se. Um, grassroots Tea Party women, well, they're the face of the Tea Party. Um, and I think it's important to reclaim the notion that while the Tea Party has been presented as a muscular phenomenon, it's really grassroots women who are proffering the narratives, and they proffer different narratives than white men. Tea Party women's narratives are particularly white, uh, intersection of whiteness, evangelicalness, sexuality, um, and reproductive rights. So the Tea Party is more conservative than the average Republican. Tea Party women, um, according to Robert's data and other data, are more Christian on average. They, they count themselves born again, some 70% of Tea Party women. Um, compared to the rest of the population, we know that white Christian America is dwindling. Um, but this is an example of Tea Party, Texas Tea Party Republican women. Again, the tropes of Obama um, as, as not American, um, kicking his like black Muslim ass back to Washington, D.C. Of course, this, is, this comes out at the same time as Texas is considering seceding from the Union, the question that was settled by uh, the previously before spoken about Civil War. Um, but they explicitly explain, in, uh, excuse me, conflate Republicanism with the Tea Party um, in their um, group. So I just want to read you one quote from them concerning Obama. Um, one of the officers of this group notes that beyond the political structural barriers that precluded women from the front lines of politics, women and men have different motivations for politics. Many women had worked alongside their husbands and the other patriots, making the forming of the nation possible. While some of their names may not be as familiar as some of the more well-known men of the time, their roles in history of our nation are never less, the less important. As has always been true, men and women tend to do things for different reasons. Men more for fame and fortune, but women are motivated by wanting to make a difference. A diverse group of ladies from colonial times made a difference in the founding of our country. Today, women of Texas Tea Party Republican women have made and will continue to make a difference in the governing of our country. Um, What's interesting about these local grassroots groups is they tend to deviate from the narratives of folks like Michelle Bachman and Sarah Palin about conservative feminism and reclaim the home, um, a kind of uh, dom domesticity um, and the home as the sphere of politics as opposed to politics itself. Um, so the local grassroots, um, there are 80,000 women who are part of various Tea Party grassroots groups across the country. This is not Tea Party Express. Um, we're talking about grassroots groups fomented and formulated in the wake of Obama's presidency. Um, about Obama, they discuss his threat in this way. The danger to America is not Barack Obama, but they have this picture, but a citizenry capable of entrusting a man like him with the presidency. It will be far easier to limit and undo the follies of an Obama presidency than to restore the necessary common sense and good judgment to a depraved electorate willing to have such a man for their president. The problem is much deeper and far more serious than Mr. Obama, who was a mere symptom of what ails America. Blaming the prince of the fools should not blind anyone to the vast confederacy of fools that made him their prince. The republic can survive a Barack Obama, who is, after all, still merely a fool. It is less likely to survive a multitude of fools, such as those who made them their president. Again, think of the constituency who elected Barack Obama. Um, they also hate women like Wendy Davis, you know, stomping out feminazis. Um, so this is a New Balance running shoe with a WD, like ostensibly Wendy Davis's own brand. And of course, um, boots in the color of Texas A&M. Um, this group comes out of Houston, so very close. 
Um, so what, what are the important effects? Um, the question that my research raises is then, given this uh, recrudescence of Tea Party women carrying the trope, uh, the tropes of rebirth and birth of a nation, um, some important questions arise for the political scientist um, and the scholar of religion at the intersection of race, religion, and politics. Um, one question is, who counts as citizen? Um, so this is actually um, one of their uh, flyers for an upcoming meeting, but what you note on this flyer is um, a very close association with Pamela Geller, groups like Act for America, um, this depiction of an Arab woman with um, an American flag on her head, um, and an association with mainstream um, Muslim groups like the Council on American Islamic Relations with the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, so a major topic of the meeting is Act, is Act for America. Um, a representative from that organization will be at this small meeting that meets at the Fox and Hound in Houston, Texas. Um, and at the bottom, you see that even though the Texas Tea Party Republican women and the Tea Party are not explicitly Christian, nor are they explicitly Republican, although this group is, um, a cross with a Bible verse, right? So this conflation of these ideals about citizenship um, is really important to note here. Um, so what's important, um, some of the other themes regarding um, this conflation of citizenship with whiteness, um, we see coming up in the election of Barack, uh, Donald Trump, excuse me. Um, Non-college educated whites who scored high in racial resentment, about 40% of the total um, of Trump um, voters in the primary um, were about 15 points less democratic in 2012 than in, pre -Obama, in the pre-Obama era. Racially resentful whites without a college degree are the most, were the most likely to flee the Democratic Party during the Obama presidency. Um, before Trump, they fled. So what I want, what I want to exploit in this research um, is the fact that these narratives were being propounded by Tea Party women since about 2009. Um, Donald Trump inherits these narratives. He doesn't create them. He actually walks into them. A mantle is presented to him, like Obama's black socialist head presented to him on a platter um, as a way of making as, as a way of making America great again with the discourse attendant and the action occurring kind of before what we saw um, in 2016 visibly. Also the tropes around hillbilly elegy, um, Hochschild's strangers in their own land. Again, these are extant during and throughout the Obama presidency. Um, so again, nothing new under the sun. Um, this has been broiling, uh, this kind of primordial soup has been broiling since 2009. Also, attitudes related to immigration, religion, and race were more salient to voter decision-making in 2016 than in 2012. This is remarkable in part because before uh, 2008 with Obama and Hillary Clinton, uh, the race factor, racial resentment as a factor in elections, um, had never been so predictive of the vote outcome. So for race to be more salient on the minds of voters, essentially on the top of voters' heads as they made choices in the 2016 elections is quite remarkable. White flight from the Democratic Party also occurred concurrently with the browning of America and Asian solidification of identification with the Democratic Party. Tea Party um, voters, Trump voters, uh, also events the least supportive and favorable attitudes toward African Americans in America. And even as the public became more polarized in their views towards immigrants and Muslims, Tea Party women were already there. Um, these are some of the ways that um, Islam is framed as the radical religious other. Um, white evangelicals like Franklin Graham, the son of Billy Graham, traveled the country warning of Islamophobia, um, claiming that the Muslim Brotherhood had infiltrated government in the form of folks like Keith Ellison, and that God had anointed Trump to keep Islam out. Jerry Falwell Jr., um, who uh, is Trump's homeboy, um, evangelical Christian homeboy, um, Trump announced his candidacy, candidacy there, gave the um, graduation address there um, as president, um, said in 
December of 2015. We have to end those Muslims before they end us. I've got a gun in my pocket. You know, you can get gun you know, certified on campus here. Michael Flynn, former NSA, um, National Security Advisor, uh, that the United States is at war with Islam. These things you've heard before, the spate of anti-Sharia legislation at the local level. Um, and again, one of the important reasons that it's um, incumbent upon us to look at these women is because um, the, lo the local level is where politics occurs. All politics is local, um, even though we see this at the national level. So finally, we also see who counts as citizen, not girls in hijabs, um, defending white democracy, which brings us to where I live and work today, which is Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, in Birth of a Nation, the KKK saves the day by initiating the race war of the ages, riding strong on their steeds, clothed in white righteousness, and the cross before them. The white union of North and South, but at the center of this is the cult of white Southern womanhood, revisaged today and embodied in Tea Party women. Now, what does this have to do with the state of society and politics in the afterbirth of the 2016 um, elections? Everything, um, including what we see here. Um, during um, the Civil War, there was an amendment to alter the preamble of the Constitution to add, we the people of the United States, recognizing the being and the attributes of Almighty God, the divine authority of the Holy Scriptures, the law of God is paramount rule, and Jesus the Messiah, the Savior and Lord of all, in order to form a more perfect union, blah, blah, blah. Um, what we see in Donald Trump is not just a new form of white nationalism, it's a new form of white Christian nationalism. The appeal of, Christ, of a white Christian nation is that it appeals to a false sense of timelessness, Rhea Ari, the religious roots of the founding, um, and the original Tea Party. Um, the dangerous parts of what we see happening in white, white Christian nationalism is it's actually anti-status, the belief that capitalism, not government, is essential, um, fascism, investment of authority in a single person in the body of Donald Trump, and a nationalism, again, of a white Christian variety, which first means foregoing anti, any anti-foreign um, attributes as uh, as endemically harmful to the country. Steve King epitomizes this well in his statement, and this is the last statement. With majority, minority, and immigration, we can't restore our civilization. The demographic, this demographic transformation will lead to cultural suicide. So I see the Tea Party as a third founding of the US, the first being the American Revolution, the second being the Civil War, and the Tea Party over and against Muslims, socialists, um, and other um, Americans, seeing blacks and those who are in the country even as failed citizens, not fit for a white Christian nation. Thank you. Thank you, Larisha. And I think I was remiss, and I, I said you were the visiting faculty fellow at the Institute for Advanced Studies and Culture and left off at the University of Virginia. Um, so we'll make sure we get that in. Um, so next we have um, Adam uh, Hankins. Um, his paper is entitled Populism in the Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, uh, Adam is a lecturer at DePaul University and an adjunct professor at Loyola University in Chicago. Uh, and he was a Schmidt Fellow at, Lo at Loyola University where he conducted research on the Southern Baptist Convention. So we'll hear the fruits of that labor here today. Um, he has a PhD in Constructive Theology from Loyola University in Chicago and a BA in Philosophy from Roanoke College. So, Adam. Hello. We will never discover a single unified cause for what happened in the 2016 election. One of the most startling aspects of the election was the 81% of evangelical Christians who voted for Trump. What was concerning about their support was not that evangelicals voted Republican, but that they voted for this particular candidate, whose coalition includes white supremacists, Rust Belt laborers, neo-reactionaries, and troll armies, whose personal values contrast so starkly with evangelicals' own, and whose positions on the issues, so far as they existed, were largely indistinguishable from any of the other 15 options. Wayne Grudem, evangelical theologian, and Michael Anton, contributing editor at the Journal for American Greatness, raised essentially the same alarm in their support for Trump. Unless Clinton is defeated, America will not survive. 
Although several attempts have been made to explain what brought this alliance together, the primary strategy has been to reduce the coalition parties to one ideological stance represented with varying degrees of transparency by different groups. I want to advocate for an alternate strategy, accepting that the ideological disparities between the enclaves are real and identifying the alignment between these groups as a result of similar attitudes, alienations, and anticipations that intensify in response to populist insurrections and become enthralled by these insurrections to some degree independently of these groups' ideological commitments. These attitudes or affects have been cultivated in some groups for decades prior to them being activated in support of the Trump campaign. This paper will look at one instance of a movement that fostered populist-leaning attitudes among its members, the Southern Baptist Conservative Resurgence. Throughout the 1980s, conservatives in the Southern Baptist Convention worked to expel the more moderate leadership, rallying around the, the doctrine of biblical inerrancy. Leaders of the resurgence and their successors assumed control of the denomination and its seminaries, dominate its institutions to this day, and continue to shape evangelical thought and politics. Like a number of movements designated fundamentalist, the resurgence both redistributed the theological significance they allotted to doctrines within their tradition and changed the affective connection that adherents maintained towards those doctrines. Elevating the doctrine of inerrancy required generating certain attitudes towards the Bible's status and towards its enemies, but these attitudes were also prepared to embrace other movements that thrived on similar affects. I will be discussing moral, epistemological, and mythic discourses from the three resurgence leaders in order to extract the attitudes that I think resonate most deeply with populism. First, I will look at the polemical writings of Paige Patterson, one of the architects of the resurgence. Second, I will look at the book Authority by James Draper, who was offered by conservatives as a reconciliation candidate in the early part of the resurgence. And third, I will look at the apocalyptic sermons of W.A. Criswell, the resurgence patriarch. I don't have any pictures of them because there's not much to look at. I will conclude by briefly sketching the interaction of these attitudes. Paige Patterson lays out the central argument of the resurgence. Denominational elites have no right to receive financial support from Baptist congregations while simultaneously undermining what those congregations believe. Protests about what was being taught in the seminaries had already occurred during the Genesis controversies in 1961 and 1969, where commentaries had suggested that parts of the book of Genesis were not historical fact. Attendees at the national convention meetings in both instances called for the commentary to be retracted, but neither conflict was ultimately resolved to their satisfaction. Patterson's polemics extend this existing frustration into a condemnation of the elitist double talk coming from seminary professors and suspicion of their moral integrity. Patterson routinely attacks liberal theologians for saying one thing and meaning another. He compares them to pirates flying a false flag, while they use the phrases and terminology familiar to evangelical faith, they assign to these terms meanings smuggled in from neo-orthodoxy or existentialist philosophy. So while in public, speaking before a church, they sound like traditional Baptists. In their classrooms, speaking to their student initiates, they freely elaborate their genuine opinions. Patterson repeatedly points to seminary professors' refusal to allow their tapes to be, uh, or their lectures to be tape recorded as evidence of duplicity. An honest professor maintaining their institutional commitments would never be concerned with their lecture being made publicly available. Liberal theologians' duplicitous use of language leads Baptists astray. Patterson states his preference to the liberal theologians of a previous era who would directly announce their unbelief making the hazards of their theories obvious, like a bottle of poison clearly marked with a skull. Liberals in the Baptist seminaries were like poison -laced Tylenol, the poison-laced Tylenol that caused several deaths around Chicago in 1982. That was a topical reference at the time. They appeared innocuous, but were as toxic as cyanide. Despite their good intentions, they inevitably deceived the faithful. Patterson compares liberal theologians to the serpent approaching Eve in the garden. Liberal theologians seem helpful and concerned about the intelligibility of the gospel, but quickly move from debating what God had said to denying God's word outright. So liberals are both Tylenol murderers and the devil. Patterson characterizes the infiltration of liberal theology into Southern Baptist seminaries as a problem of integrity. If liberal, liberal professors had integrity, they would state their beliefs in plain, accessible language before denominational bodies. They would not confuse lay people by confessing the Bible to be infallible and yet filled with errors. They present themselves as interested in offering the best interpretation that scholarship can offer, but their methods are so specialized and complicated that the common believer can only trust their conclusions, making them a human priesthood of interpreters mediating God's truth to the masses. 
Liberal theologians use their academic freedom as license to contravene the mission of Baptist seminaries and often even ridicule the conservative beliefs that students received from their home churches. Patterson's polemics restrict the possibilities for demonstrating integrity to either capitulation to conservative theology or resigning from the seminary. This is a solution for faculty who refuse to accept the view of biblical inspiration that represents the doctrine of the majority of Baptists. Quit and find work somewhere else, which Patterson considers the final guarantee of academic freedom. Patterson believes that the pervasive decline of traditional faith in the seminaries was partially the consequence of increasing centralization in the convention. In an article prior to the major 1985 convention meeting, Patterson designates the denominational centralization following World War II alongside inerrancy as a primary cause for the resurgence. He states that the growing alienation of the denominational bureaucracy from grassroots conservative values had promoted insensitivity towards the people paying for that bureaucracy. There are two concerns here relevant to the question of populism. First, Patterson's position on denominational centralization is close to the reaction that Baptists had against desegregation. In 1956, Criswell would tell the Southern Baptist legislature, Southern Car South Carolina legislature, that he resented forced integration at the command of the Supreme Court when the North couldn't integrate their own cities, and many Baptists agreed. Additionally, the Baptists that publicly supported desegregation often worked for the seminaries, the denomination, or the denomination-owned press. The bitterness from this previous conflict carried over into the resurgence. Second, a minor theme in Patterson's polemics is that the position of the conservatives is being distorted by the Baptist press. As denominations enter their decline, he explains, their institutional arms cling to power, and the Baptist press has succumbed to this desperation by misconstruing conservative criticism of the denomination. Patterson calls for future editors to be hired based not just on professional experience, but also impeccable doctrinal integrity. Patterson's aggressive moralistic tone was suitable for his role in the resurgence as a partisan bulldog. James Draper, by contrast, was offered by the conservatives as the reconciliation candidate between them and the moderates in, in the 1982 convention presidential election. His short book, Authority, The Critical Issue for Southern Baptists, shifts the field of critique from moral discourse to epistemology in making the case for resisting the spread of liberalism. Draper understands the resurgent controversy as an epistemological dispute about authority. In his account, there are only three sources of authority, the Bible, the church, or reason. It should be noted here that under reason, Draper also includes sense experience and mysticism. Any epistemic claim grounded in a human source of knowledge operates from a basis of truth radically divergent from divine truth. Draper argues that liberal theology constitutes a shift in authority from divine revelation to existentialist rationalism. Biblical revelation consists of propositions flawlessly communicated by God through the biblical authors. Refusing to accept as true the propositional claims made by the Bible requires an interpreter to substitute their own vaguely mystical encounter for an objective standard of truth. Draper's book depicts the authority of the inerrant scriptures as absolute and yet astonishingly fragile. If any of the Bible's statements are questioned, its authority has been dethroned and supplanted by human judgment. Slight and imperceptible, even undeliberate disagreements with any Bible proposition constitute the total abandonment of God's truth. Draper insists we must submit to the Bible prior to being able to determine whether or not it is true. He writes, if we wait until all the evidence is in, we will wait until the second coming of Christ. By then it will be too late. We accept the inerrancy of scripture, not because we can reconcile every difficulty, but simply because Jesus is Lord. The criterion of Draper's epistemology is an act of submission that eliminates the risk of any challenge to the Bible's description of reality. Uh, Patterson is similarly adamant when he says that the minimal condition for ending the resurgence is that denominational employees can never under any circumstances call into question any statement of the Bible. Even minor concessions by otherwise solid conservative scholars can be perilous. Students will always go further than their professors. Draper accounts the time he took his children on the oil derrick slide at Six Flags over Texas. As he pushed his burlap bag over the slope, gravity began to take hold, and he was seized by visions of a crash. Uh, he had the impulse to cling to the berries and halt his descent so his child wouldn't fly from between his legs. Any theologian who would dilute the historic Christian teaching of biblical inerrancy finds themselves in the same position. By admitting the possibility of debate about the facts of God's word, these theologians have tipped themselves towards the edge of disaster and are bringing their denomination along with them. 
Liberals are a threat to historic Christianity, Draper warns, and along with it, any serious commitment to saving the lost. Existentialist theology is incapable of inspiring evangelist zeal. Existentialist theology rejects precisely those doctrines that drive evangelism, substitutionary atonement, and eternal damnation. With an em without an emphasis on saving souls, Christianity devolves into a moral code focused on improving social conditions. Liberal missionary inertia perpetuates itself by denying conservative theology any hearing in the seminaries. Like Patterson, Draper takes seminaries to task for denigrating the beliefs of conservative students that they learn from their home churches and asks why academic freedom is only for liberals. When do conservative scholars receive more than cursory attention in liberal courses and syllabi? It is a common resurgence trope that the Southern Baptist denomination, as the only denomination still growing in numbers, is the best hope for, for the future of Christianity. Draper asserts that the encounter of existential theology cannot survive divested from revealed biblical propositions for the sake of their phantom experiences and their narcissistic academic freedom. Liberals are risking the gospel of Christ and the souls of the entire human race. Draper's epistemological framing of the resurgence culminates with a dire prediction about the end of historical Christianity. W.A. Criswell, the celebrity pastor of First Baptist Dallas and the source of the resurgence's popular legitimacy, casts his critique in the lurid prophetic symbolism of the Book of Revelation, especially drawn from the period of nightmare upheaval between the removal of the church and Christ establishing his millennial reign through victory in the final war, the period designated by premillennialists as the Tribulation. Criswell's vision of the Tribulation centers around what he calls the Satanic Trinity, Satan as the anti-father, the beast as the antichrist, and the false prophet as the anti-Holy Spirit. Criswell tells us that the laws governing the tribulation are this also the laws governing the present age. If the satanic trinity exists in the end times, it must also exist among us now, in limited form, partially repressed by the Holy Spirit, yet fitfully wreaking the same havoc now as it will then. Criswell expounds the work of these malign agents to his congregants so they can remain alert to their sinister influence. In his 1983 sermon, The Fall of Lucifer, Criswell explains that in this world age, Satan is an angel of light. Accordingly, Satan is the leading proponent of all forms of cultural enrichment. Satan, Criswell preaches that Satan supports progress and social justice. He advocates for good government and is a patron of the arts. Satan is the ally of every revolutionary struggle, and he is the most religious of all God's creation. Satan is naturally deeply involved in the educational system, an advocate of scientific inquiry and cutting-edge research. Satan supports all cultural achievement as long as it never mentions God nor preaches the hope of the gospel. Criswell's description of the Antichrist strikes a similar tone. Criswell's beast is a charismatic and entrancing public figure, an economic mind of the highest order, an unrivaled political genius, and a staunch friend of Israel. He will have a career of unbroken success. In a time of unprecedented chaos, the Antichrist will deliver the human race into a political golden age. Peace will reign, markets will surge, and the beast will have solved all social problems independently of the grace of Christ. Finally, the false prophet or anti-Holy Spirit builds a church around the magnetic appeal of the Antichrist. The false prophet will be winsome he will, and kind. He will have a gentle domesticity about him. The religion of the false prophet will dispense with the supernatural, with the unevolved, and with anything aesthetically appalling to modern sensibilities like salvation by sacrifice. The religion of the anti-Holy Spirit is a humanism, and its paradise is the socialist, socialist welfare state. The final goal of the satanic trinity is inaugurating the Battle of Armageddon. Through unclean spirits, they gather the armies of the world in the Middle East for a bloodbath to consummate our era and melt history. When they assemble, Christ appears and crushes all his blasphemous enemies simultaneously. Criswell preaches, I want you to notice that things do not go quietly and gradually merge into the kingdom of our Messiah, but they, things come catastrophically. They come in blood. The satanic trinity behaves like liberal Baptists do now. They reject the supernatural and grotesque parts of Christian, uh, traditional Christianity. They focus on social justice rather than redeeming sinners. And they cooperate with surrounding culture rather than insisting on biblical truth. And since the laws of the tribulation are the laws of the present age, Criswell warns that the influence of liberal Baptists on the denomination is just as destructive. Liberals, he says, chew like termites on the institutions built by the blood of our Baptist forefathers. They, the curse of liberalism is destroying the convention as it has mainline denominations and can only be reversed by revival and resurgence. And similarly, as liberals anticipate the terrible iniquity of the tribulation period, the judgment on that iniquity is anticipated as well. Criswell preaches the triumph and conquest of Christ over the liberal parasites. 
The resurgence was eventually successful, ousting or neutralizing the moderates, but it lacked the finality promised by Christ and his seraph army invading in force. Patterson will frequently call for the controversy to be concluded by a revival, after which the word of God will never be questioned again. Nothing like that occurred. The resurgence was certainly a last hour, but not the last hour. Baptists are still waiting for the catastrophic end of dissent to arrive. These three were part of a decade-long operation to exercise selection on the Baptist population, amplify particular affects, and rhetorically constrain the possibilities for acting on those affects. Disparaging the integrity of seminary professors and denominational bureaucrats assumed a level of moral perception that divided the resurgence movement from the moderate Baptists. They could perceive the flaws in the the denominational structure and the curve of the convention's decline in slow, painful decadence, as Patterson called it, was clear. At the same time that the resurgence was dislocating conservative congregations from their existing ecclesiological identity, they offered the truth of an inerrant Bible as the sufficient basis for a renewed identity. But by the same stroke, this truth was shown to be deeply precarious and could only be maintained by drastic action. Draper writes at the end of Authority, although we do not want to do anything intemperate, fanatical, or ill-advised, we also do not want to be guilty of doing nothing. It is not clear what type of drastic action would be necessary to finally resolve anxieties about the fragility of the truth. Accordingly, premillennialism displaces the resolution into the mythical, and believers are encouraged to fantasize about an instantaneous, catastrophic, gore-soaked answer to the questions that disturb them. At the end of the resurgence, the Southern Baptist Convention was less capable of tolerating dissent and more antagonistic towards their surrounding culture. The same movement that closed them to the mainstream opened them to rhetoric that promised to secure their culture and livelihood through dramatic intervention. The resurgence was a complex event with ramifications still being felt today. My goal for this paper is not to give a definitive account of what the resurgence was, but to outline those elements that I think made Baptists most vulnerable to seizure by populist impulse in the recent election. Their moral certitude, coupled with a precarious truth, realizable only through catastrophic instance, reacted to a rhetoric of political crisis independent of the theological or ecclesiological ideas that structured those attitudes, in a real way despite their theological importance. We see the same constellation of attitudes again and again in other groups in the Trump coalition. The trolls' confidence in their lulls weaponized against the normies, the economic nationalist lucidity about the dying republic proclaimed against the Davos set, even the countless men and women in failing towns that voted for Trump just because they needed anything to happen and could tell that nothing Nothing had yet, all echo the same impulsion instilled into the Southern Baptist Convention decades ago. The populist passions driving Trump's campaign pressed into service any number of isolated right-wing groups, groups with more or less ideological dissonance from Trump's rhetoric, who are more or less today disappointed with the results of their adventure. Thank you. Thanks so much, Adam. Uh, next, we will hear from uh, Seth uh, Gators. Uh, his paper is entitled Critical Complexities, Religious Secularity, or Secular Religiosity, and Black Lives Matter. Um, Seth is a PhD student in the Department of Comparative Studies at uh, The Ohio State University, and his research investigates the intersection of religion, race, and politics. He holds a BA in psychology uh, from The Ohio State University an MDiv from Trinity Lutheran Seminary, and a THM from Fuller Theological Seminary. Seth, welcome. Uh, Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Brings me great pleasure. I'm grateful for this opportunity to be able to present to you today. Uh, My presentation explores the complex and entangled relationships that dwell amongst religion and secularism, and within that binary race as categories of modern social performance and collective identity formation, and I hope to parse this out. Though from the Enlightenment onwards, these entanglements have been obscured, really they cannot be studied in pure, and the key word is pure, isolation from each other because they are woven together. Uh, To assume such a religion and secularism binary machine as constructed on a project of purity, here it is again, is problematic because it's reminiscent of the phantasmal racial categories and governance of master settler 
colonial practices of enslavement. Pure secularism is not only a failure, but it's fantasy. And religion as a pure, on the other hand, a discrete phenomenon that's privately located in the individual is a peculiar modern creation or invention. These fabricated purities, again, are not the free-flowing reality of everyday people. Complexity and entanglement is reality, and here uh, the creativity of the everyday life occurs and erupts. Uh, this dichotomy is known and it has been questioned, but I would still like to push the conversation further. I see that this critical conjuncture has severe political consequences. What's at stake within this social binary is a particular racial order and practice of sovereignty or governmentality. Race is obscured and consequently by extension, Organizing and broader coalitions for social justice at the fundamental humanistic level are obscured as well. For instance, do we find this problem lurking in the uh, uh, religious policing and categorical claims of conservatives that the Black Lives Matter movement is uh, heretical, uh, unorthodox, or perilously secular? And contrastively, is this lingering in some, on the other hand, the secular policing working to eliminate religion entirely from the public or the political arena. As a way forward, I am utilizing the Black Lives Matter movement as a conceptual window to complicate these uh, dichotomies in between the religious and the secular. Asking such questions as what role does religion play, if any, in the Black Lives Matter movement, or uh, such questions as does a justice movement have to be openly religiously affiliated uh, institutionally or otherwise in order to invoke a sacredness or is the Black Lives Matter movement an indication of the rise of secularism amongst uh, millennials and in our culture in general. I perceive that an analysis of this critical conjuncture amongst black millennials helps us to disrupt the governance and the sovereignty of uh, social binaries. There particular black praxis of anti-blackness anti constitutes a performative critique which unsettles, ungrounds, and decolonizes Western dualistic thinking that is grounded or settled in an aspiration for pure, again, pure difference. Instead, there is rather a more creative interplay going on where the boundaries in between religion, culture, and politics are rather impure, messy, and uh, very complicated. And um, this is the complexity and the entanglement of which I speak what I'm after, wherein each inflects or interpenetrates the other. Watch this. Secular orthodoxies inhibit larger quests for liberation because they are racially underwritten as by anti-blackness. Modern secular discourse works to govern or master together both race and religion. Secularism has long reigned as a feature of the privilege in, in, of which I speak whites and men and elites. And as a social privilege, its configuration is deeply connected to class, race, and gender in the West. Whereas, as indicated by Vincent Lloyd elsewhere from, and I quote, the margins, the fact that there is a mixing of religion, culture, and politics is self-evident, end of quote. This is because race and secularism are entwined and whiteness characterizes the secular, just as whiteness suffuses what is called, and I will speak to this later, whiteness suffuses the multiracial. This racial order must be unveiled for without a critical stance up against it, we may unwittingly be offering an endorsement. The process of this unveiling of this particular imperial pedagogy that is projected as secularity is what Shelley Fisher Fishkin calls, and I quote, the interrogation of whiteness, end of quote. It is hard to trace for some since it is an unmarked category, uh, but George Lipsitz calls this, and I quote, the possessive investment of whiteness, end of quote. 
operating as an unmarked category, never acknowledging its role, and therefore without interruption, continuing its dominance, ensuring white supremacy, protecting property, guarding interests, maneuvering and seizing presidential elections, and so on, while imposing subjugated or oppressive roles upon non-whites. Now, though this is hidden to some as fait accompli, modern racial discourse lurks within these dichotomous operations, and of which I speak are religion and secularism. I want to pause for a moment. Um, tech team, that PowerPoint presentation was right. It's a blank screen. All right, thank you. All right, so just to repeat now, though hidden to some as fait accompli, modern racial discourse lurks within these dichotomous operations in between uh, the religious and the secular. Uh, this binary reifies a racial order around the white figure or Western man or otherwise known as the human uh, with a capital H. And this particular racial imaginary that is hidden within this binary machine is what I'm after. Ruth Frankenberg says this myth of whiteness is, quote, a location of structural advantage, end of quote. A standpoint, a place from which white people look at themselves, at others, and at society, and a set of cultural practices that usually go unmarked and unnamed. Uh, in other words, being invisible. So since race and secularism are entwined and entangled, note how, on the one hand, the unmarked racial category, and on the other hand, the unmarked religious category, mark what in the margins is deemed as, on the one hand, racial others, on the other hand, religious others. Or put another way, the enlightenment desire to stand beyond religion, which is in turn ideologically recasted as secularism, and on the other hand, the liberal desire to stand beyond race, which in turn is ideologically recasted as multiculturalism or even color blindness, both of these desires to stand beyond or above, right? Both of these are complementary delusions. For the seemingly beyond is in reality the sovereign or in a panoptic fashion, disciplinary power. These tactics of sovereignty seek to control and exclude religion in the same way that race is controlled or excluded. So, in fact, Multiculturalism only exists in a constitutive relationship with race, as does religion only exists in a constitutive relationship with secularism. These terms are not chronological, according to some Western narrative of secularity. Neither are these terms oppositional, but they are co-constituted, epistemes that are centralized upon, again, Western man, the white masculine, or the human with a capital H. Multiculturalism and secularism produce anti-blackness and are discourses of power that construct subjects in a particular way. The same, the, the very same modern logics that, that constructed metropole to colony or center to periphery, the same modern logics that constructed whiteness to blackness are operative in the sacred secular split. Uh, modernity theorized secular oppositionally to itself, uh, oppositionally to an invented religion. And in this way, it constructed itself as the modern secular. But both of these ideologies are discourses of power and they symbolize or manage a crisis of social meaning guarding against the supposed, and I quote, threat of miscegenation, end of quote, as called by uh, Jared Sexton. And functionally, they work to preserve the integrity of racial whiteness and the political economic order by producing and policing, please watch this, policing the color line just as much as the religious line 
is policed. Yet as ideologies of anti-miscegenation protecting purity, again, they have been imposed in the interest of the privilege of the status quo and thereby uh, they are, they're shot through with an air of anti-blackness and are constitutive of the present socio-political and racial order. Uh, contradistinctly in the margins, and if I had time, I would be able to list a retinue of uh, these practices in the margins, but we're focusing particularly on the Black Lives Matter movement. Contradistinctly in the margins, what we find is that there's a more creative interplay that accounts for the transgressing of religious and secular boundaries amongst everyday people, ordinary people. And these reach for possibility otherwise pointing to all sorts of interpenetrations that help us to account for the various interconnections and their complexity in a non-binary way. And so consider more closely uh, with me for a moment the Black Lives Matter movement. Many scholars and activists have recasted this revolutionary era up against uh, the black power movement of the 60s and 70s. Um, and each of these are touted by some to be secular movements, Black Power Movement, Black Lives Matter Movement in their respective eras, according to some sort of secular rubric. And they're necessarily, according to this narrative, understood in opposition to the traditional or the standard religious institutions of black life, markedly the black church, whatever your understanding of that may be, that was characterized as central to the civil rights movement. Yet aside from these dichotomous mischaracterizations, they are really participating in a more transgressive dynamic. Being largely composed of black millennials, this movement has something to teach all of us in blurring the boundaries that prevent many from perceiving the broader conjuncture for social justice at the fundamental humanistic level for all human beings, not just particularly those that may be categorized as black, for the sake of freedom and justice. Working at the limits of modern secular discourse, black social life or blackness performs an other mode of existence outside of that according to the liberal narrative beyond the simple opposition of the religious and the secular that is relational, not racial, that is ecumenical and not essential, an alternative practice of the religious, an alternative practice of the secular that is not reduced to this simple opposition of the sacred secular split. And hence, because of this, this playfulness and flexibility, it's excessive to and disruptive of the modern binary machine's hegemonic constraints. Though often uh, brutally injured, its alternative praxis creates an opening and an outside world within this modern one, not limited to the violent constraints of the religious secular divide. And this sort of dynamic is, is like a in the world, but not of the world. So oppositional constructions of the sacred versus the secular or civil rights versus black power or spirituality versus uh, social justice or you know, politics versus religion and so on, uh, these, these constructed oppositions are really rather entanglements of otherwise modalities that point to more critical and complex human experience that is also evident in black social life. This debate reveals a particular discomfort that many share with entanglements that, that cannot be governed by puritanical modern categories. For instance, though many attempt to dichotomize the civil rights movement versus the black power movement, the latter movement, black power movement, is an evolution of the former struggle for freedom. Therefore, to perceive one as merely religious and the other as secular is historically inaccurate and it's untrue. Uh, attempted dichotomies created in between the two miss a more comprehensive understanding of the black freedom struggle that serve as an attempt to undermine the praxis of black emancipatory struggles as a discriminating technique of administration, 
serving to secure the status quo. Really, black activism is now largely unchurched and organizing outside of traditional religious institutions. As opposed to the civil rights era uh, when institutional religion was in a certain sense central, right? It is not a movement, even though it may be uh, expressing itself culturally in this particular moment this way, the Black Lives Matter movement is not a, as far away from religion and spirituality as is thought to be by many outsiders. Actually, with it, these rigid dichotomies that we speak of are dissolving and collapsing in on themselves. For example, consider Kendrick Lamar's hip-hop track, the Grammy Award-winning hip-hop track, All Right. It also marks the significance of spirituality to the movement as it is considered an anthem of the Black Lives Matter movement. Watch this, the opening stanza of the song identifies the struggle of black life. And I quote, all's my life I had to fight, end of quote. It identifies the challenge of black life. And I quote, I'm effed up, homie, you effed up end of quote. And it expresses a cry of lamentation from the biblical Psalter, and this lamentation, and I quote, hard times like God, end of quote, is directed to God in one breath, while in the next it appears towards Jesus, as is intimated through the cry, and I quote, Nazareth, I'm effed up, end of quote. Poetically, the artist conflates Nazareth, i.e. Jesus and God, as the ultimate source to receive his prayers and lamentation. It then concludes, quote, but if God got us, then we gonna be all right, end of quote, which theologically posits the providential presence of God in black life. Such a claim is revolutionary as it is messily tangled up within the genre of hip hop that is understood to some as secular entirely because of its nonconformity to traditional or conservative religious forms or normativity. Yet, secular to some and profane to others, through song, through hip hop, theology enters into the public or the political sphere. Black cultural production actually indicates an excess of spiritual forces that transgress these modern binaries. Furthermore, on orthodox Christian theological terms, many have noted the quote, unorthodox backgrounds of the three women often cited as movement founders as if they inherit no spirituality at all. Consider their spiritual language, the three founders, women. Number one, though she claims Marxist ideology, co-founder Alicia Garza uses the suggestive Twitter handle, quote, love God herself, end of quote. And mentioned on the Black Lives Matters organization website, guiding principles that state a commitment to, and I quote, intentionally build and nurture a beloved community, end of quote. Which of course harks back to the theological guiding vision of the civil rights movement from Dr. King himself. Two, uh, consider Patrice Coolers. She is an Ifa practitioner, which is a West African traditional religion of divination. And therefore, she is a religionist or spiritualist that has her own particular framework of belief. Three, consider Opal Tometi. She identifies with liberation theology. Moreover, in a tweet on her Twitter page on the 28th of August, 2015, Opal explained, and I quote, for the record, dot, 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 I'm a Christian, I'm anti-capitalism, and I'm for the dismantling of a two-party system that is doing nothing for us at all, period. Hashtag, that is all, end of quote. <laughs> Individually, their respective spiritual commitments are presented as aberrations from an American Christian conservative norm. And this may be true to a degree, but it does not secularize or epithetically dichotomize, demonize, or trivialize their praxis and activism as illegitimate or problematic. As the movement of a new generation, Black Lives Matter is more often than not understood as a strange, alienated, or adamantly opposed to church-based visions of social transformation, but one must sift through 
easy and simple bifurcating frameworks, right? To see rather confluence and connection for the fight against injustice. This movement has sought a new idiom to render black life as significant and faithfully wed to the synchronicity of spirituality and social justice. You can't separate the two. So this movement sees that black social life is sacred. And here, there is no divide. So hopefully this um, deepens the understanding that black lives matter. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Seth. Uh, finally, we have Rima Vesely Flad. Uh, her paper is entitled Seeing Jesus in Michael Brown. Theological Protests as the Performance of Purity in the Black Lives Matter Movement. Uh, Rima is the Director of Peace and Justice Studies at Warren Wilson College, and her first book, Racial Purity and Dangerous Bodies, Moral Pollution, Black Lives, and the Struggle for Justice, was just published by Fortress Press in June 2017. Uh, Rima has a BA from the University of Iowa, an MDiv from Uni Union Theological Seminary, um, <clears throat> Uh, MI uh, and a uh, PhD from Union Theological Seminary as well. Uh, so, Rima, welcome. Mm -hmm. I first want to say thank you to my co-presenters. Your papers are all amazing, every single one of them. I feel like I could spend hours just talking with you. And I want to actually pick up right where Seth left off. Um, unbeknownst to both of us. We actually are thinking about many, of, many similar things. So this research paper comes out of the last chapter of the book I just published in June. And um, I won't go deeply into the theoretical frameworks I employ. I use a lot of Mary Douglas to talk about concepts of purity and pollution, but due to time constraints, I'm gonna focus really on the voices of clergy who were on the ground in Ferguson, and really still are on the ground in Ferguson. Let me first say that the Black Lives Matter movement challenges police executions of black men and women and youth. It is a movement that furthermore illuminates the perpetual degradation of blackness in social and political spheres, and thus illuminates racialized practices of violence and marginalization. Alongside Black Lives Matter activists, my own research argues that black men are killed because their dark skin symbolizes moral and physical danger. Several centuries of discourse on black bodies as moral polluting entities have resulted in perpetual subjugation and harassment by government officials. The result is the erection of symbolic boundaries between black and white bodies, between white neighborhoods and black neighborhoods, between those who are protected by law and those who are violently subjugated to the whims of police officials. So as I mentioned, I'm primarily concerned in this paper thinking about the theological assertions that black lives matter. And really, the Christian narratives that are employed by clergy who have joined vanguard activists. And because I don't have tremendous time, let me just first point out, and Seth pointed to, to this as well, that there is a kind of um, reference to the civil rights movement and the black power movements, um, and especially in the civil rights movement, clergy, as is well known, really assumed front stage, center stage, which is not at all true in the Black Lives Matter movement. So the clergy I've gone and interviewed are on a certain level peripheral to the broader movement, and yet have become mentors for many of the young people and who have opened their churches as sanctuaries. And I think um, if we think about symbolic constructs of blackness and whiteness, of pollution and purity, it's important to privilege the voices of clergy who are working with symbolism and who are really bent on inverting traditional notions of power that reinforce, reinforce rather than contradict the central assertion of the Black Lives Matter movement. So what I argue is that clergy members often offer important symbolic reconstructions of blackness. They challenge historical images of blackness as physical representations of inner immorality and pollution. 
for clergy in the Black Lives Matter movement, the criminalized body of Michael Brown and the crucified body of Jesus convey a theological assertion that criminalized black youth who are associated with moral pollution are crucified as was Jesus 2,000 years ago. The theologians who have been active in the Black Lives Matter movement interpret the birth of Jesus as protest against accepted first century pollution boundaries. For example, the Gospel of Matthew narrates Jesus' birth as in a stable surrounded by animals because, quote unquote, there was no room in the inn. Reverend Sekou, an ordained elder in the Church of God in Christ, theologies, the, I'm sorry, speaks theologically about the poverty and pain of Jesus' birth as significant for Black Lives Matter. And he says, I understand the Gospel of Jesus as a story about God choosing to become flesh in the body of an unwed teenager mo teenage mother among an unimportant people in an unimportant part of the world. Jesus is a Palestinian Jewish peasant living under Roman occupation. He is the salvation of the world. God is flesh, was subject of an empire. Similarly, the Reverend Tracy Blackman, who leads a congregation in the suburb next to Ferguson, interprets the meaning of Christ's birth as a political confrontation between impoverished, polluted Jews and wealthy, elite Romans. And she says, and this is actually a fairly long quotation, but please bear with me as I think this is really pro quite profound. In the birth of Christ during the Roman Empire, high militarization, Mary and Joseph are in the midst of a system they are forced to comply with. Jesus, as God incarnate, could have been born in wealth and royalty, but God chose to manifest God's self among the poor and marginalized in society. Not even to just the poor and marginalized, but a poor brown woman in an Afro-Semitic context among this Roman Empire in poverty, in such abject poverty that it is highlighted there is not even a place for him to lie his head. I think that if you can be born anywhere you want to be born, which I believe about Christ, and if you choose to be born among the lowly, not among the high, that the birth in and of itself is an act of protest. You would choose to associate yourself by privilege of who you are, and that elevates those who are not elevated in any other kind of way. So for me, that's an act of protest, which continues throughout Christ's life and reign. I can read the story of Jesus of Nazareth into all oppression, but if you take this situation and read the story, you know that after the birth of Jesus, Herod mandates that all children are killed because he is trying to get to Jesus. There is a slaughter of innocence that happens from the empire in this text. These casualties are an attempt to keep this child from rising because the story has already been prophesied, has already been told. That story is very much rooted in the killing, the assassination of men of color. I think that the killing of Mike Brown, too, is a manifestation of fear, of systemic institutional level. And so we choose to kill that which we fear, which we cannot control. And the black male in our society has been categorized and depicted as someone to be feared. So I believe that even in the killing of Mike Brown, if you listen to the interview with Darren Wilson, the white officer who killed Mike Brown, he does not call him anything human. He calls him the Incredible Hulk. He calls him a demon. Fearing that certain bodies cannot be controlled, such as Herod feared Jesus at his birth, illuminates broader social practices in which identified groups are subjugated, even killed with impunity, to sustain powerful positions. Indeed, liberationist clergy draw multiple parallels between the circumstances of Jesus of Nazareth's births and the conditions of black people, especially black youth, in a society premised on white norms and institutions. The white bodily norm is contrasted with the morally polluted black body. Despite the fact that Darren Wilson and Michael Brown were the same height, six feet four inches, Wilson observed in Brown a menacing threat that justified murder. The conditions of Christ's birth then illuminate the narrative of liberation theology. Those who are socially unimportant and feared are, in God's eyes, chosen to save all of mankind, humankind. Those who are politically dispossessed have the capacity to be spiritually powerful, the saviors of the world. In privileging the status of the powerless, Christians have the opportunity to meet God. 
So this can also be extended to the the narrative of Jesus of Nazareth, a poor Jew, a carpenter, a dispossessed Palestinian um, who ministered. And this ministry is is also central to liberation theology and to the act of contesting racialized constructs of pollution. Liberation theologians identify Jesus of Nazareth as a nonviolent revolutionary who organized the poor in the face of occupation. Gustavo Gutierrez, a Latin American priest who penned the first text on liberation theology in 1968, wrote, but the poor person does not exist as an inescapable fact of destiny. His or her existence is not politically neutral and it is not ethically innocent. The poor are a byproduct of the system in which we live and for which we are responsible. They are marginalized by our social and cultural world. They are the oppressed, exploited proletariat, robbed of the fruit of their labor and despoiled of their humanity. Hence, the poverty of the poor is not a call to generous relief action, but a demand that we go and build a different kind of social order. What clergy and Ferguson argue is that in the first century, Jesus of Nazareth uplifted those whose bodies were deemed polluted, bleeding and invalid persons, lepers, demon-possessed men and women. And in this way, Jesus reached out to, quote unquote, the least of these. Reverend Blackman reflected, I believe very strongly that there is a God who is a God of justice and of equity. I believe very strongly that the intent of the Bible is to point to that Jesus, to the Jesus who is the God of the oppressed, a black Jesus that is representative of those who are marginalized and who are targeted and who are oppressed in every way, and have always believed that about Jesus. The clergy on the front lines of the Ferguson protest assert that to self-identify as Christian is fundamentally a political act that pushes against racialized pollution boundaries, as Jesus himself challenged the marginalization of those who were deemed polluted. Furthermore, to carry one's body into protest wearing a clerical collar is to proclaim affinity with morally polluted bodies. Clergy then challenge symbolic constructs of pollution by donning elite symbols, embracing polluted bodies, and facing police violence on the front lines. These liberationist clergy have elevated Christian symbols to rebuke state-inflicted pollution boundaries. At the vanguard, kneeling and praying, taking communion, and reading names of those killed by police officers. They have used symbolic power to challenge the material power of the police. Reverend Sekou recounts clergy activism in the nights after Michael Brown was killed. During their nightly protest at the Ferguson police station, local clergy came out to support them and to bear witness in solidarity. Clergy knelt and prayed in front of a garrison of police representing I'm sorry, repenting for our silence and supporting the young folks who we followed to the space of resistance and place of injustice. After our spontaneous prayer meeting, young folks asked us to step aside as they stood in the middle of the street willing willing to risk arrest. The line of police wielding long brown wooden batons and donning riot gear marched lockstep toward the young folks in the street. Something got a hold of me. I darted out in between the youth activists and advancing police. I knelt and prayed. I was promptly surrounded by police, snatched up and placed in a blood-stained police van, but the youth would not back down. For almost two hours, the youth sat down in the middle of the street and refused to leave until I was released. Captain Ron Johnson was ushered from his home and came out to negotiate with the youth, and they were not having it. I was eventually released from the police van. On Moral Monday, as a part of Ferguson October, a group of faith leaders were arrested as we prayed and called on the police to repent for being part of an evil system of policing. As an act of resistance, we created a memorial for the Mike Browns of America. The Reverend Charles Burton, a local pastor and activist, laid down on the soaked ground. His body was traced with chalk and candles were lit. Pastors and rabbis read the unarmed names of those those killed by police. Clergy positioned themselves along the police line to take confession. We then advanced toward the entrance of the police station. Police placed batons against a few of our throats, swung wildly at others, but we prayed, raising our our voices in song and worship. We moved again to enter the police station, and many were thrown to the ground and arrested. 
To self-identify as Christian, then, is to confront these racialized pollution boundaries with one's body. Following the black liberation theology of James Cone, Reverend Sekou stated, first and foremost, the gospel is not a neutral term. It is motivation to resist oppression. Thus, we must resist in the way Jesus resisted. We must be present with the least of these as he called and be willing to go to the cross as he did. These liberationist clergy have identified young protesters as carrying out the liberationist ethic of Jesus of Nazareth, despite the fact that many of these youth resist the institutional church. But the youth are adopting powerful symbolic rituals in preaching through nonviolent direct actions, demonstrations, marches, chants, die-ins, sit-ins, and vigils. God is present with the youth. And the clergy say that. They pray, for we have seen you in the faces, O God. We have seen you when they scream and yell and they are angry. We have seen the very face of God in them. These clergy see Jesus and Michael Brown because Michael Brown symbolizes the morally polluted black body, the very body embraced by Jesus of Nazareth. The lack of quality public education, for example, Brown lived in the sole unincorporated school district in the state of Missouri, and disproportionate criminalization result in significant poverty, institutionalization, and hopelessness in the St. Louis area. Dietra Wise Baker, a chaplain for the St. Louis County Juvenile Detention Center stated, for all intents and purposes in the context that I serve in every day, Mike's body is still on the ground. Fellow clergy in the St. Louis area echo Baker's theological interpretation. The length of time that Brown lay in the street, which was four and a half hours, along with the character assassination initiated by officials after his death, sparked outrage and defiance. The conditions further illuminated the desperate conditions underlying the chant, we have nothing to lose but our chains. In the wake of the August 2014 protests, Reverend Blackman, along with Reverend Starsky Wilson, the pastor of the St. John's UCC Church in St. Louis, joined a Ferguson commission to propose solutions to poverty, early childhood care, education, and transportation in Ferguson. Wilson, who was the co-chair of the Ferguson commission, reflected, what if Mike Brown is our Jesus Christ? What if Mike Brown is the thing that pushed us to the point of doing God's true work that is needed to be done? For these clergy, the fundamental act of challenging racialized constructs of moral pollution, of uplifting the same persons marginalized and outcast due to their bodies and their social status is the work of Jesus. Baker, too, saw the Ferguson protests as a call to the community, particularly the church, to address the broader systemic injustice in Ferguson and the broader St. Louis area. She said, we're always talking about doing something, but something about this movement forced us to be the hands and feet for the Christians and for Jesus. And in fact, clergy nationwide drew on the analogy of Michael Brown and Jesus. Valerie Bridgman, a visiting associate professor of homiletics and Hebrew Bible at Methodist Theological School in Ohio reflected, these Ferguson citizens screamed in the face of police who trained their military-grade weapons on the crowds, wounded. And Michael Brown became the symbol of a community's rejection of black communities, not just in Ferguson, but throughout the country, being despised. Michael was crushed and bore the punishment for being black in the United States for us all. And we are left to ask of God, why are the Michaels of our communities bearing all of our iniquities? Liberationist clergy have made explicit connections between the political tenor of Jesus' time and the oppression experienced by black youth who are constructed as morally polluted today. Marginalized groups of women and of queer youth, of young people like Michael Brown who are raised in communities with unincorporated school districts without access to affordable transportation are linked to the polluted groups of Jesus' time. Social elite, elites then determine how persons without status are able to access institutional benefits. On the Sunday after Michael Brown was killed, Reverend Wilson preached, the extreme poverty of Jesus' time feels like the poverty of our time, with a chasm between the haves and have-nots, the people who got and those who get forgotten. We call it the poverty tax, like the lack of access to healthy foods, the over-ticketing for driving while black, and the higher taxes for gas in the hood. There were three warrants for arrest for every household in Ferguson. When we say poverty tax, we're talking about ticketing that targets people disproportionately and has them under the burden of warrants. 
For the clergy, then, the youth were enacting a kind of biblical vision. God was with the young people in the streets who would not back down. A prophetic action was taking place. God chose morally polluted black youth. God stood against militarized police with tanks and machine guns. God's people would prevail. The youth were a persecuted people akin to the Israelites fleeing the Egyptian army in the Exodus story and the Jews who were disempowered under Roman occupation. Michael Brown represented Jesus the Christ and furthermore, by protesting his death, the black youth in Ferguson represented the meaning of Christ. The call to action to Christians nationwide stated explicitly, just get on the streets, come be on the streets, come at least once, get on the streets. I'm telling you, you're gonna meet Jesus there. Jesus is on the street and you're gonna be transformed if you come to the street. These liberationist the clergy then understand their commitment to the Black Lives Matter movement as pushing against social boundaries that demarcate black lives as inferior, morally polluted and socially marginalized. To join the protesters is to reconstruct, indeed to resurrect black skin, hair, phenotype, and cultural expressions as symbolically pure. These clergy play an important role in the re symbolic reconstruction of blackness because as clergy, they ritualize notions of purity and celebrate a gospel message that privileges, quote unquote, the least of these. The liberationist clergy then interpret the dimensions of Jesus' life, his birth, his ministry, his crucifixion, and his resurrection in the context of black oppression. These clergy are challenging policing and imprisonment practices by claiming divine presence in the black bodies that are constructed as morally polluted and disproportionately criminalized. God is present in the midst of suffering. Jesus, as God in body, was persecuted as a member of an occupied territory within the Roman Empire and chose to minister to the morally polluted members of his community. And thus, to follow Jesus in a contemporary setting is to embrace the black bodies that are demarcated as morally polluted. To walk with Jesus is to redefine the morally polluted outcast as chosen by God. To resurrect Jesus is to engage in sustained protest, to mentor and care for weary activists, and to institutionalize racially just practices that acknowledge historical and contemporary racism and hold officials accountable. To sustain racial justice protest is to perform purity in a context in which marginalized black people are constructed as degraded. The Black Lives Matter movement in all of its dimensions has directly, and I would say strategically, pushed against racialized pollution boundaries by insisting on the importance of black lives. Even the statement, Black Lives Matter, says so much. And this includes black bodies that are marginalized even within black communities. These Black Lives Matter protesters perform symbolic acts of purity on multiple fronts, not just by confronting police, but also privileging queer, including transgender leadership, by engaging in new social media strategies, as well as historic embodied demonstrations. And finally, by reconstructing the image of Christ in the slain body of Michael Brown and the fierce street protests that erupted after his execution. Thank you. I hope you'll join me in giving uh, all of our presenters one more round of applause. A really excellent set of papers. Um, Great, so we're gonna take about 20 minutes uh, to take some questions. We have two microphones down here at the front that we'll need to use because this room is so big. Um, no one will hear any questions. So if you have a question, feel free to come up uh, to the microphones. There's one on each aisle um, here in the front. Um, at the end of the 20 minute period, um, we are going to have the business meeting for the religion and politics section. Um, so if you're interested in helping us think through next year's call for papers, uh, and we also have two open slots on the steering committee. So if you're interested in nominating yourself or nominating someone else uh, to participate in the steering committee to help us shape uh, the papers and panels like this uh, for next year, uh, please stick around. We're gonna meet uh, just right here, down here on this, uh, this side uh, near, the, near the podium at the end of the uh, question and answer uh, period. So um, let's start with uh, questions. Uh, and I'm gonna take them from sitting, sitting down, but just come forward to the microphones uh, if you have a question. Question for Adam Hankins. Right. Um, the figures you discussed were, as you said, from the, from the 1980s. Uh, so I'm curious about whether you see any generational shift, uh, especially in light of the fact that 
according to some of the data I've seen, Southern Baptists are beginning to see some numerical decline as well. So that old argument that conservative, you know, conservative theology will be a bulwark against what happened to the liberal Protestant denominations, that seems like that situation may change. Plus, we're just, a, just the, the younger people, people in the ministers in their 30s and 40s, faced a different situation than the folks in the, in the 80s. So I'd, I'd welcome your comment on that. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's correct, there's sort of a, sort of a generational shift. Um, Paige Patterson is still, he's still the president of a, of a seminary, so he's still exerting like direct influence. I think, in fact, I think he canceled tenure there like three years ago, so his own ideas are being implemented. Uh, Draper is, um, he's still alive. He, he ran the Southern Baptist Publishing Company, Lifeway, for a long time. I think he just recently retired. So the, it, it's not, there is a generational shift. Um, it may not be quite as pronounced. Um, at the same time, I, right now, they recognize the lack of growth. Uh, they don't, as far as I know, they're not thinking that it's because of a lack of you know, too much conservatism, much like the you know, Republican Party, it's conservatives have just not been tried hard enough, right? So I think right now that the conflict is over, there's too much Calvinism, Calvinism harms missions because you, you believe in predestination. So do we need to keep Calvinism in the domination or should we try to drum this, them out as well? Make one quick, uh, oh, am I on here? Hello. Uh, I just want to make one quick comment on that. Um, you're right about the, the SBC data. It's now 10 straight years of uh, a numerical decline uh, in the Southern Baptist Convention, uh, which is fairly uh, new for, for them. Uh, but the, the kind of chart, Ed Stetzer has been very good at, at uh, LifeWay Research about documenting this and kind of making it public um, every year. So that's something we've clearly seen. Along, and that follows a kind of trend, a decline in evangelic, white evangelicals overall just over the last uh, decade as well. And one kind of notable fact is that as the median age is creeping up, it's now um, uh, about 56 or 57 years of age is the median age of white evangelicals in the country, um, that one of the key factors actually has nothing to do with uh, theology and has to do with evangelical women getting college degrees. Uh, that happened about a generation later than white mainliners, um, and that it's uh, declining birth rates as a result of white evangelical women getting college degrees. So, yep. um, if I recall correctly, was there a study that you had that showed that, in fact, the only religious denominational sort of block that was growing, that was keeping its young people, let's put it that way, keeping its young people, were in fact historically black churches, historically black denominations? Yeah, the story is, so historically black denominations have been fairly stable. They've been kind of holding on. Uh, and uh, there's been, but there's actually been growth among Lat and Latino, both Catholic and Protestant, uh, and also Asian Pacific Islander congregations are also growing. But it, so the shrinkage is all within white, non-Hispanic um, uh, denominations. Right, both mainline and evangelical. That's right. Yep. And Catholic. Right. Yep. Good afternoon. I really, really enjoy the talks, and they really had me thinking quite a bit about, um, especially Professor Gaither, uh, discussion about secularism and religiosity. Um, one of the things that occurred to me when you were speaking, I was thinking about the sacrosanctity of speaking about black lives as its own, not just movement, but idea, right? That goes back at least, I think, 200 years to Jos Josiah Wedgwood's Am I Not a Man and a Brother, right? And one of the things that I, I'm, I'm curious about, I think, is is this idea of, is this, this the argument that you're making about the impurity of these two categories, of the secular and the sacred, was that already troubled maybe for generations prior to this, to this, to this situation? Because what we have, I think, with Many of the religious, black religious thinkers of the early 19th century and of the late 18th century were 
serious critiques about slavery and its secularisms, about the emergence of modernity, about the emergence of capitalism, and what it was actually doing to make bodies less sacred, to make life less sacred, to make these people sort of, as, as I think it's the uh, Marx term, dead labor, rather than living beings. And I'm wondering if the idea that you are troubling now has a precedent, and if that precedent could even further reinforce your argument. I would say um, definitely in, ag in agreement with um, your comments. This is not a new discovery, and uh, it's not something that was contrived in academe. Um, but of course, this is something that has existed, um, and, and there's no there's no point I find in historicizing it. It just has been um, a reality in the practices of everyday life. Um, however, those practices are coming up against the hegemonic. And, and so the interrogation is to disrupt the hegemonic, to expose it, to unravel it, to see what sort of technologies and di disciplines of power are operating upon particularly non-white subjectivities, right? So um, what, what I'm trying to uh, put the magnifying glass on, which is already there, is this thing, which is another mode of existence and life that is outside of um, modern thought, right? Modern notions of uh, religion and uh, this Western liberal narrative of secularity. How are these discourses being used? That's my question. Uh, uh, why, why are people suspicious if we bring it to our contemporary context? Why are people suspicious of the Black Lives Matter movement? For what reason? And of course, those particular sorts of suspicions from a particular political inclination have reared their ugly head before, right? So, uh, I mean, to, to protest um, through the valence of black social life is violent not necessarily materially, but that stance violently disrupts master settler colonial practices of enslavement, right? And so uh, these discourses are being used to manage, um, to master, to reign over particular subjectivity. So my, my point is to say, these things are discourses of power. These are sources of power. And how are these sources of power being used to construct subjects? That's, that's the point. Now on the other end, I mean, that's the deconstructive piece, but on the other end, there's this thing. There's another mode of social life, another reality beyond or outside of modern thought. And the difficulty is that, that we've been given a certain critical apparatus, a certain critical vocabulary, right? Uh, you know in, in, in our, our, our modern paradigm, and it struggles to describe a manner of living that's beyond the very protocols of modernity, right? So the, the challenge is how can we describe what we smell, what we, what we think about, what we feel on the ground? That's the difficulty, right? And, and this thing, this thing I'm trying to, uh, I'm trying to approach and trying to uh, surface, bring to surface, uh, you know, as, as something that is disruptive, positive, is, is something that has existed from time immemorial in what I'm calling black social life. But here's the thing, I was trying to use this to speak to a broader audience because in the Black Lives Matter movement, there, there's a strand of humanism. What do I mean by that? Well, we're approaching the universal through the particular, the particular concrete experience of, of black millennials. And I said, black millennials have something to teach all of us. Why? Because there's a universal content in there about humanity and about being human. So the praxis 
of black social life is not essential, it's ecumenical, it's not racial, it's, it's relational, it's not according to our, our diseased social imagination, you know, of phenotype and racialization. There's another mode of, of, of social life, right? And uh, uh, black millennials have stepped into a river, a stream of, of liberation that has preceded them, right? It's the same thing that's happening. Same thing, you know, that was happening in black power, civil rights movement, same thing that was happening uh, you know, within uh, slavery and in the fields and in the hall of the ship. And, uh, you know, before we even got here, I'm not giving it a uh, birth certificate at Jamestown 1619, right? There, there's something there, uh, Howard Thurman called it, what, what technologies of the spirit cause you to survive, right? Through the middle passage, right? There, there's something there which not only benefits black folk, but benefits, can benefit everybody, right? So, yes, I, I agree with you. I too very much appreciated that as someone who intentionally is living in Oakland, which is one of the centers of the Black Lives Movement, and as a theologian, and also I'm pastoring an African-American congregation, but as a theologian, with a lot of the, quote, white liberals around me, trying to say there's something deeply theological going on here too. So the way you've tried to you know, say that the construct of the religious and the secular and the way we separate that, it keeps us from seeing or from understanding, I think is very helpful. Because you know, trying with, working with these folks to understand dimensions of racism, uh, there in Oakland, it's very difficult because they're operating under those categories. And the Black Lives Movements and, and some of the leaders I met with help us to see, and so I appreciate very much what you're doing. Uh, my, my question on a much different, um, and maybe you have some comments about there, we can talk later, uh, which I hope you're doing, this is a bigger work that is a part of, I hope. Uh, but I would like to hear in the remaining minutes a little bit of dialogue. You know, we've got two two sets of very different kinds of presentations. And I think how, as we move in this highly polarized society, we can move beyond what Black Lives Matter, you know, all of the things the last two papers were getting at, and in fact, what we're dealing with there. Are we dealing with a bifurcation where you see the Southern Baptists and the, you know, the, the followers of Trump, et cetera, uh, on two different wavelengths, or is there some way of connecting. Who wants to take that small question? <laughs> Should be. Um, I actually had a question for our per first presenter. Remind me, how do I say your name? Larisha. Larisha. You talked about the resentments that have been broiling with the women in the Tea Party, or the, maybe not exclusively with the women. And you talked about since 2009, but it's interesting in my own research on the penal system because I would actually historicize that and go back as far as 1966 or even 1968. And I wondered if you could speak to the rise of Nixon, the um, working class, or what do they call it, the white, working class voters who are now making up the Republican base and kind of how that ties into the rise of the Tea Party and um, the political thinking of these women. Because I think it is very related in terms of um, resistance to an integrated society, the rise of the penal system, the emergence of Black Lives Matter, all of that. Right, so um, a lot of what you see in the white Christian nationalism of um, what I would say is, I would just back up and say, Part of the purpose of the research is to um, locate what's happening now, um, kind of back, like uh, locating the beginning of you know Trump's rise, Trump's ascendance with the Tea Party, but particularly looking um, at the discourse of women, the kind of gender discourse, um, and a lot of way that that is reflected is in these. And and I I thought I had five minutes left after I read three pages, and so I was like rushing through. So anyway. Um, 
part of that is located in a re when it, going back to the kind of rebirth narrative, um, Tea Party women really focus a lot on birthing citizens, not just the home as the sphere of politics, um, and who's in and who's out. And then part of that um, notion of, of raising citizens in the context of like white Christianity um, is a repeat of the dog whistle, a repeat of the Southern strategy. So no, there's nothing new under the sun. Um, the new form that it's taken is it came in response to you know the first black, black president. So it's a recrudescence of, of that particular formulation. But you're right, it's not, um, in terms of the racial tropes, they're not new. Um, they've just taken on, like it's old wine and new wineskins, if you will, right? So. Can I follow up on that just a little mm -hmm. bit? Because I was gonna ask you about um, this question, it's right, fits with this. You named the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, and the Tea Party movement, right? And the Tea Party maybe is this, you called it like the third founding. And I was wondering, where's the Civil Rights Movement in that? Like, like it seems like there, there's, there are at least the reaction to the Civil Rights Movement that was about the sort of shift from white Southern Democrats to white Southern Republicans, yeah. right? It was all about, uh, this, that happened really with Reagan, was all about a reaction to the Democratic Party becoming the party of civil rights, essentially. Um, and and like, would you sort of um, ground, or how would you link back up the sort of white nationalism we're seeing now to that initial sort of white flight from the Democratic Party in, in the South to the Republican Party? So, I mean, I this isn't like, um, I don't think that that's unconnected from the historical narrative I'm trying to draw. Part of my point of um, focusing on the three foundings was really thinking back to how um, black gains, but this is where it's relevant, black gains especially, uh, you know, the threat of white citizen, uh, black citizenship, the threat of black sovereignty, the threat of black embodiment of um, the kind of Lockean ideal um, leads to these kinds of retrenchments both in public policy and then in terms of how that um, comes out in the form of, of statism, government, popular leadership. So that would be something that fits in the trajectory. It wasn't something I was focusing on at kind of at the macro level in the sense of like founding and, and the narrative of refounding America and taking America back, but precisely in terms of um, party realignment and other kinds of uh, trends at the level, the micro level, yeah. So I was like kind of, you know, ratcheting out to a bigger theme, but, but absolutely it fits there. Um, back to, is it Rima's question as well? So if it's in that narrative. Right, maybe we have time for one more. Uh, we had, do we have one more? I don't know if we ever answered your question <laughs> about kind of the hopefulness or lack of hopefulness. But. All right, so we'll do one more question here. Yeah, thank you all so much for sharing your work with us. This is really, really interesting and productive. And I have, uh, I've been trying to formulate a specific question for a minute, but I can't quite do it. So I more want to raise a couple of themes that I saw across the papers that I think are really interesting is, especially in the rise of the religious right, right, in the sort of co-optation of religious conservatism by the Republican Party and the marriage of those two things, one of the foundational narratives and the spark moments of that was about changing the IRS tax system to go after uh, de facto segregated Christian schools, right? And so as the sort of techniques and discourses of colorblind racism are being formulated, language about taxation is used a lot in that, in sort of discourses around taxation and around IRS policies and things like that, and welfare system especially, become one way of um, using a sort of colorblind rhetoric to maintain power structures. And within that though, clearly within religious right discourses at least, religious ideas about personal responsibility, individual sovereignty and things are used to provide theodicies for the suffering of black people that is not going to be alleviated because of changes in the white, in the welfare system. So I was wondering if you could, if, if in your research, if, if any of you have seen some threads between the way that these discourses of taxation and colorblindness and religious theodicies all weave together in, in really interesting and subtle ways to preserve power structures. Um, 
I would say this is not something I'm deeply familiar with, but I do think there are multiple ways in which that can happen. So um, this is, again, not something I do research on, but I'm thinking about some of my familiarity with school systems and how they're funded. I'm thinking about the connections between what's called um, the school to prison pipeline and the maintenance of power by say, uh, passing minimum sentence drug laws and keeping people in prison for very long periods of time and how there's a kind of political economy that um, results from that. So again, I'm not so versed in taxes, but I think you're onto something in terms of thinking about the maintenance of political power um, and place or space um, and revenue guarding and, um, and how certain bodies are associated with certain places, how racialized that is. I think there's a larger narrative or a larger picture to deconstruct that is, as you say, interrelated. Please just uh, join me in giving uh, our presenters one more hand, a round of applause. Thank you so much. Um, so we're going to have now, we're going to adjourn this uh, actual discussion, but we are going to have uh, right down here on the front uh, our religion and politics unit uh, meeting. Anyone is welcome, uh, whether it's your first meeting or you're a veteran, um, please come down if you really want to have a discussion. We're going to talk about the call for papers for next year, and also, as I said, we have uh, two openings on the um, steering committee, so nominations will be welcome as well. So just uh, take, take uh, time to gather down here at the front, and we'll kick it off in just a couple of minutes. <laughs>